Imagine if you could make a major dent in reducing global warming by just choosing something different to eat for lunch tomorrow. Would you do it? Over the last year, I've worked with the team on the largest rainforest conservation climate mitigation project in the world. This was on some land out in Indonesia. And I wanted to talk to you a couple of things I learned in that process and really talk about two things. Quick update on climate change or global warming. And second, how rainforests play a critical role in the solution. But I also want to talk about how an individual, one person, even you, can really make a difference by the choices you make and what you eat. So let's, let's do the quick update on climate change. Some of the top scientists around the world have told us and shown us over the past 10 years since this issue has been highlighted that what we're doing is putting a lot of extra carbon dioxide, CO2, and greenhouse gases into the air. And this extra CO2 is forming a thermal insulation blanket around the planet and warming it up faster than our natural systems can actually manage it. We didn't have this problem before, but when we've started using a lot of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, and burning them over the last 100 years, 150 years roughly, we've added a lot of CO2. And also, not only from coal, which makes up about 63% of the emissions that are in the air, but from deforesting the forest and burning the trees to clear them for agriculture or cattle. And that's somewhere between 20, 20 and 25 and 30 percent of the emissions in the, in the air every year. These numbers move around, but that's roughly what's happening. So how much carbon dioxide is in the air, and, and why is that really important? This is an analysis that shows a roughly half a million years of every year how much carbon dioxide is in the air. And the data comes from ice core samples that were taken out of glaciers, where every year the annual snowfall traps air in that layer and you can go back and look at it and do isotope analysis to figure out exactly what the concentrations of CO2 were. And, and what you see is a, 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 little, a rough band between 180 parts per million at the low and 280 to 300 parts per million, it's a trace gas, at the high. And about every 125 years, there's roughly an ice age. And so the low CO2s correlate to the bottom of this cycle, and the high CO2 amounts correlate to the top end of the cycle. Now, when it's really cold, <laughs> at the bottom of the cycle, the temperature, the average temperature on the Earth is about 8 degrees Celsius lower than it is right now. The seas are about 350 feet lower because of all the surface ice that exists. And if you're standing about here, there's about a mile thick of ice above your head. But look at the graph and see what's happened in the last 100 years. We've put in another roughly 120 parts per million in the last 100 years through this extra emissions. And that's, um, that's a lot. If you look over a shorter time period, say 1,700 years, and you just look at temperature, after a gradual cooling period, in the last 100 years, we've had this rapid increase in the temperature of the planet. And it's up about a one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, which is halfway to the warmest it ever was in that prior graph. And there's still more CO2 being pumped into the air. So we're starting to see this relationship between CO2 concentrations and temperature. If you look at observational data, which is a little more accurate than the methods that were done for the last two graphs, you'll see a, a pretty tighter, or much tighter correlation between CO2 concentrations and the temperature. You start to see roughly the concentration increase and the temperature rise. Last week, NOAA released some data showing that 2016 was the warmest, hottest, year on record since they started collecting data. Now, this graph shows average temperature comparisons around the world for last year alone, and everywhere it's red, it was warmer, and everywhere it's blue, it was colder. You see, there are a couple of cold spots, but there are actually a lot of red spots, and this is happening all over the planet. And it raises, for me, it, it raises a couple of questions like, okay, we're still putting a lot more CO2 in the air. How hot is it going to get? And the modeling that's going on now at the IPCC and other institutes is really focused on trying to figure out the predictability of how hot it'll get and what do we need to do. And can we adapt to this? Because it may get warmer, but what does that really mean for us now? And one of the things we're starting to notice is there are a lot more extreme weather events, which is defined as, if you look at this graph, this is another an analysis of just 2016. The purple and blue dots are high precipitation. At the extremes, those are floods. The brown or the tan dots 
are actually droughts, low precipitation. That's in comparison to what the average was for a 30-year period or ending around 1990. Now, droughts and floods and volatile weather are not very good for us. In fact, the, the two and a half million known species need a much more stable weather pattern to survive on this planet. It's highly disruptive to have such extremes. Let's go back to uh, what we could possibly do about this. So as we said, we know how the extra CO2 has gotten into the air pretty accurately, mostly coal and gas, some burning of forest. But we really have two problems. I think everyone agrees we've got to reduce our emissions. But we really got to figure out a way to get the extra CO2 back out of the air. No one really talks about that a lot. And when you do, there's some scientists who propose things like what are called large geoglobal projects where you're either trying to manage the amount of energy coming into the sun and reduce it so it doesn't get as hot, or you're putting large amounts of chemicals into the seas or into the air to, to manage the natural cycles that reduce CO2. Because if we don't do anything, that CO2 is going to be in the air for thousands of years. There's nowhere else for it to go. So this is where forests come into play. Forests are beautiful. They do, uh, when you're not cutting them down, they do a lot of things. First of all, <laughs> forests take CO2 out of the air in large scale, and they create large banks of what are called negative emissions or uh, climate sinks or carbon sinks. These forests, and maybe from your biology class, you, you remember that through photosynthesis, the actual chlorophyll in the plants' leaves and the trees' leaves take the energy from the sun, convert it into sugars for food, and the trees grow and store vast amounts of carbon in the wood, in the trees' roots, in the soil. And that is something that we need, I think, to allow to happen. Because if you look back, say, 10,000 years before humans started degrading the forests and cutting them down, there were about 18 billion acres of forests on the world. About half of those were in the tropics, where it was very wet, very hot, things grow very rapidly. And in the last 10,000 years, we've either degraded, which has basically cut down a lot of them, or deforested 80% of the forests on the planet. In fact, right now, there's only around 1.5 billion acres of rainforest left on the planet. That's, a, that's the size of a, an area a little smaller than Australia. Every year, 3 to 5% getting smaller, getting smaller. So, one of the most destructive things that's happening in the rainforest is the production, the, the large-scale production of a product called palm oil. Now, Palm oil, it's an edible vegetable oil. It grows very fast in the tropics. It's the largest vegetable oil product in the world. In the last 20 years, it's, it's been a product that you can find in almost 40 to 50 percent of the, of the commercial grocery stores around the world, primarily in Asia and in the U.S. and Europe. You find it in cooking oils, you find it in cookies, cakes, biscuits. Because it's a, a semi-solid at room temperature, you can use it in other products too, like soaps and shampoos and, and cosmetics. So we have this use of palm oil. And one of the interesting things about palm oil is there are only really two countries where 85% of the palm oil gets grown, Indonesia and Malaysia. And for the past 20 years, they've been cutting down vast areas of rainforest and burning them to allow for palm oil production. These are space shots of the smoke in 2015 that covered most of Singapore and that whole area from just forest being cut down. It was uh, during the post El Nino season two, so this was pretty intense. The monsoons come in later and, and put out a lot of the fires, but it's a repeating pattern that's happened year after year. One of the problems here is there, there's not just one big company or two big companies doing this. In the forests, there are about 150,000 small farmers spread out over a vast area who individually cut down small acreage and then sell their fruits. They cut down the forests, they burn the trees, clear the land, plant the seeds, and then within three years, the plants start growing. They look like this. These are small palm tree plants. Then within three years, they start harvesting fruit. This is what the fruit looks like. That goes to a mill, gets processed and turned into palm oil. So this is the forest before, untouched. And a couple years later, palm oil. It's a homogenous monoculture. Lots of snakes, lots of rats, but not a lot of other biodiversity. So it creates a problem. Where does this biodiversity actually go? Because rainforests contain 50% of the biodiversity on the planet. In the areas in Indonesia and Malaysia, there's hundreds of endangered species and critically endangered species like orangutans, pangolins, hundreds of bird species are being uh, lost. The, um, 
Orangutan is kind of special to me. He's uh, genetically one of our closest cousins, which is great. But there are only about 60,000 left in the world, and they're all in these two countries. That's down 80% from 100 years ago. And in the next 10 years, it's projected that 30% of the habitat they live in is going to disappear due to this process. So it's a, it's a pretty tough problem. <clears throat> One of the things you can do, and this is where you come in as an individual, you have to learn, and it'll take about two minutes for you to learn, how do you identify when there's palm oil in the products you eat? It comes under several names. Sometimes it's very easy. It just says palm oil. Other times it's palm kernel oil, because you can actually take a slightly different type of oil out of the kernel of the fruit, or palm vegetable oil. Sometimes it's, it's abbreviated an acronym. Sometimes it just says vegetable oil, but it's really palm oil. You have to dig deeper and find out. Once you learn that, you can look on the ingredients for boxes and figure out, hey, is what I'm eating actually palm oil or not? And then what do you do? You have a choice. I call it the just gas choice. You can either eat it or not eat it, but there are a lot of companies, both in the supply chain and in the consumer goods area, that are very aware of this problem and have gone out and made no deforestation pledges, which is terrific. They're aware of this and they're starting to work on it. But it's one of these critical, you know, easier said than done situations where because of the confusion in the supply chain, because of the very difficult challenge of tracing who actually sold what fruit from what field, from what processing plant, through what processor to a thing, it's extremely diff difficult. And these companies need, I would say, more than just a little encouragement to keep on the fight to try and trace this back and solve this problem. And the way you can do that, because we have great tools and we have language, is text and email. You'd be remarkably impressed how powerful an individual can be by just texting and asking a company a question about their products. Companies are extremely, extremely sensitive to consumer input. In fact, they spend billions of dollars trying to get you to buy something. And when you stop buying it, they want to know why. But if you can get ahead of them and tell them, we don't like what you're doing, or we want you to come up with a substitute, use a domestic, use something else but this. Or prove to us that you're actually doing it in a way that's sustainable. That really helps. And you have that capability. Every one of you does. So we're down to a system where you can either make a choice and do something about it or continue the system we've set up. I actually think this is one of the more powerful things because not only by putting pressure on the companies that do this, you can reduce global warming, you can save biodiversity, you can actually get something else good to eat. Thank you for listening. <laughs>